All right, folks, I'm pretty sure there's not gonna be anything to see here, but uh, it's Halloween night, and I was just walking around with my, uh, my flashlight and then looking for mice. Usually I look under the front of the house there. That's the corner where I usually see activity. And I look at this impatient, and uh, see that guy right there? So he was just sitting, just hanging out, and I don't know what this guy's doing. I don't want to get the light too on, too far on him, but I'm pretty sure that's a baby right there. I don't think it's a bull, but look at the size of this guy's tail. Chloe is kind of like a dog. She follows me around the house and uh, she is a definite lap cat. The second I sit down, I have a nice toasty kitty on my lap. Unless the uh, wood stove is going. So I did redeem myself today. Um, what I did is I put some wood on this, this log holder. So I got the wood in the house and it's, it's been, you know, even if I'm not burning a fire, it's still dry in the house. So, uh, with the wood going, um, drying the wood as well. And what I'll try to do is use the dry wood to get things started. Then once I get things started, I can add the wetter wood little by little. But again, at this time of the year, I I'm not anticipating burning many long fires, just enough to knock the chill off in the house. And the temperature on the stove is, uh, you know, where we are. This, this fire's been going for probably 40 minutes or so. So where we are, there shouldn't be any smoke outside the house. All right, so if you look at that, you can, you know, you can just see the waves of the, uh, the heated air there, but there's no smoke. So you just burn the fire hot and fast in the fall, just enough to knock the chill off, and then let it go out before you overheat the house. Hey folks, uh, on my way in this morning, we're actually at the town hall. Uh, today's November 1st, so if you're watching this video, <laughs> today's November 1st. So if you're watching this video today, it's today. <laughs> but um, today's November 1st and um, the property tax declarations are due. Uh, anybody that has a business is familiar with getting this form in October. You list out all your, your assets, give it to the uh, town so they can figure out how much to tax you. So today's the deadline for dropping it off and I always seem to get it there uh, the last day. Hey folks, how you doing? So we're back at it again, and it's it's actually early afternoon. Um, I, you know, I think I put a clip where I dropped off my um, property tax forms. Uh, this house is a half hour the fast way, 45 to 50 minutes the way I usually go with the scenery. So it's later in the day, and unfortunately I gotta leave early today too. So, um, Today we're not going to do a ton, and I guess I'll let you guys let me know if you want to see this piecemeal every day, or you know I can just wait a few days until I have some real progress. Whatever works. Um, I did just put a clip of me sharpening my pruners, and that's something that um, I, I really don't know how often I do that. I mean, I, I haven't done that for at least a month. Haven't been using my pruners a ton. I cut back some perennials. But that's all you really need to do is just a few minutes with the file. Uh, it's a diamond file. Brush off the junk and then just put a little oil on them. You might have to, um, there's a screw on the Felcos that controls the tension to, to turn the lock on and off. You might have to mess with that. But, um, you know, sharp pruners are just a nice thing to have while oil pruners as well. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to do that once in a while. Um, let's just show you what we're probably gonna do today. So I think what I'm gonna do today is, uh, is start pruning through here. 
and uh, you know we'll see how far we get and when I'm pruning I'm not really going to start looking to take these way back all I'm really going to be doing is, is basically thinning them out um, and once we get them thinned out then I'll see if I want to take them back a little bit but I may leave them all you know fairly long I mean I know the holly I can get away from from the railing here both of these I want to trim the back a lot you know all those those longer ones on the Olga will be will be down and probably the same amount back into the shrub but um, I, I don't I may end up taking them down farther but the initial run through I will just kind of try to to shape them and then as I'm going I may get a feel for where I want things to be so what I'm doing is working my way around the back and um, I just want you to notice the back here you know all it took was see how I cut here there's a cut down there you know you're you're just creating a little bit of space behind this shrub so that air and light can get back there and then you know there was pack of sander growing here um, I had to rip all this out when I did this over 20 years ago but that way you could get back and also uh, you know clean out the pack of and uh, all these weeds coming up in here as well but uh, I just want to show you this one branch um, you see this you know, so you're basically just going through and, uh, oh, let's do this without breaking the camera. You just get in and, so it's even getting stuck on the roots of the Virginia creeper there. But uh, you're just getting back and just, you know, it's gonna be bare with something this, this long that it hasn't been pruned, but just get back and open up some space. And even as you look out of the house, the window's at this height. So it's like, you know, to look down at the hole, you're really gonna have to be like halfway up the window trying to find it. No one's gonna notice this, this openness in the back. I need to be real careful because every time I walk back here, I'm tripping on the uh, Virginia creeper down here. Hopefully that's Virginia creeper. Um, so I want to show you folks this branch right here. See this whole mess, which uh, it actually broke off at one point. So look where that meets the shrub right down here. So this is where I keep my Felco 600. First we use our Felcos and we just get that out of the way. Get that out of the way, dead, dead. Dead, dead, dead. So um, now that we're in here, we can just take our Felco 600 with a nice sharp blade, no sense I'm wasting your time with a dull blade. I'll just throw that out and then I'll very carefully just pull that out of there. So you see what we're doing? We just made a little bit more space in there. And then I can come back with the pruners and prune up here. I just finished pruning the back of the two Olgas. So here's the view from the front. And here's the pile of junk. But um, I mean, this probably took me maybe 10 minutes tops. Um, but as we walk in, I just want you to see, once we get to the back of this holly now, you see all those leaves you know, the leaves fall off the roof, push the branches down, and then we got, you know, this spot where everything just kind of gets stuck. And it's just so easy to, to just get behind here and just, you know, give or take two feet away from the house, 
you know, just, just cut it back. It doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line. You know, just cut it back and it takes so little time. It makes such a big difference as far as easing this whole process of pruning and, you know, cleaning up the leaves. We're at the back of this holly. Turns out there's a plug over here. That's always good to know. But, um, you know, it's fall, but I, I don't even know if these leaves that are stuck here are from this year. These leaves with the scale on them underneath. I mean, I think this is just junk that fell and, um, you know, just got trapped and it's just been there for a long time. You can see the foliage is actually burned out, you know, because it's got no light underneath these leaves. The back of these shrubs was pruned back and if I didn't keep stopping the camera too often, uh, I can't imagine this would have taken more than 20 or 30 minutes. And then, you know, I just raked out all the leaves back here and, um, you know, I do need to come back and rip the vines. I don't know if I brought my gloves today, but I need to rip all this uh, Virginia creeper. And again, anytime you see Virginia creeper, there could be poison ivy mixed in. So we're gonna make sure we have gloves on when we pull that. But there's the pile of junk, some leaves, and I just wanna show you, you see this branch right here? See this, this kinda, it's this big thick branch and it comes out and it basically um, defines this corner of the shrub. So where do we cut this branch? You know, what's the best option? I mean, there really is no right answer. You can cut it up high if you want. You can cut it in the middle. Uh, you can cut it down low. Wherever you cut it, most likely, and there are no guarantees, it will start growing new growth below where you cut it. And if the new growth doesn't come on this branch, the energy that would have gone to this branch will go to some of the other branches on the shrub. So for me, what I'm kind of liking, see if I can switch hands with the camera, is uh, we're gonna take it to about right here. And there is gonna be a hole when this is done. And if you get them where they want to break like that, uh, don't cut all the way because it's going to get real messy. Just cut most of the way, stop, and then grab your pruners and finish the cut. And then we can just... Um, you know, we just, we just took a lot of weight off the corner of this shrub. All right, so we got this corner of the shrub cut back, and um, anybody watching this that's like, wow, you really hacked that? Uh, I mean, I did, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, it's early November, it's, it's November 1st. You know, I really would prefer to be doing this in early spring if I had to do it, so the plant would flush new growth right away. It's not gonna die, it will, Next year, if we come back here, all these branches I cut back, you will see new growth coming. Not along the entire length. You know, wherever I cut them, go back, and wherever there's a, a bud ready to, to start growing, they'll start growing. So it is gonna be a little bit bare, but I mean, there's really, this, this landscape was let go for so long, there really is no other option besides ripping out and ripping out may be an option, but it just seemed like, uh, you know, I feel good about what's planted here. I just, I just wish it was pruned a little more often. We've now got a little bit of space between the father gilla and the, uh, the blue holly. I'm starting to get things a little bit lower, but um, I think what I'm gonna do is, is, is stop pruning for a minute until I get the blower and go ahead and blow all the leaves out of this guy because, um, you know, it's getting pretty sparse. And, and I wanna say, I mean, I'm not really happy with the way this looks, but there's really no other way to do this besides going back to the bare foliage because it's been, it's been sheared for so long that all the growth 
take a look here, all the growth is on the last foot of the shrub or so. You know, once you go from the tip back in, there's just nothing for a foot. And then because it's sheared and, and all those leaves fell on it, they're not helping either. But now what I can do is, is start working my way over and I, I think I'll end up separating, there's a little bit of holly in the back here. I'll end up separating the holly and the olga a little bit. But now I can kind of start working my way over here and being fairly gentle if I can. We'll see what happens with this Olga because I don't want to, um, you know, there, there was no way around it with the holly, but the Olga looks like it's, it's a little bit looser. So I, I hopefully can, can prune that a little more naturally. But uh, with, the, with the Olga as well, like here's a branch. So um, once I cut, once I cut past here, there's nothing. So what I really want to do is, is reach in and like every one in three or one in four long branches, cut them back and, and bring those into the shrub and then just cut the rest of them pretty much even with the plane of the foliage. And again, this holly, it's going to look kind of nasty for a while. But by the end of the summer next year, probably by summertime next year, it'll have flushed out more growth and it's gonna be fine. You see this holly, there's two branches in the back, not this branch, but this, those two. I will probably get the Felco 600 and just shear those two off, which should then remove some of this back corner. And then this will just be its own little entity, oval, ball, whatever you wanna call it floating over here and then it can start to regrow. All right, we're getting pretty close to being done with these three. And I really do like the way that the, uh, the Olga's came out. I mean, this is really what I was going for, where I, you know, I went in with one third to quarter of the branches and cut them farther in. So you see, I cut like right in here, cut one right in here. Um, here's another one. I cut one in here and then I cut some back a little less. So what's going to happen is, is this will get more buds and, and thicken up. And because more light is getting farther into the shrub, hopefully it's going to get more buds farther into the shrub as well and, and thicken up. Uh, the holly once I blow the leaves out, I'll go back and clean that up a bit, but it's gonna look, it's gonna look pretty sparse this winter. Um, all I really need to do now is, you know, like this is all, this is all dead foliage because it was being cut way out here. So I just cut it back beyond where there was foliage. So now it's got to start budding out again and, and it will, I promise. Whenever you're doing pruning, bring your five tine manure fork um, I just picked this one up last year. It's a five-tine manure fork, you see in that? And it's, uh, it's made by Corona, but it's aluminum. I really like it. It's, it's really lightweight. Uh, it's got a good feel to it. And I, you know, I do have a wooden one I like as well that I've had for like 20 years. So it could just be the shiny new tool syndrome. But um, whenever you're pruning, pruning, weeding, whatever. Keep your five-tine manure truck around and you can just save your back from having to bend over and uh, you know, mess with the rake getting stuck in the branches. When, when I bring my truck, what I'll do is I'll just park the truck nearby and pick the stuff up with the fork and then I can just uh, throw it right in the truck. But um, this five-tine manure fork is just, uh, it's just a time saver. Like it makes the job easier and faster while you're moving at pretty much the same speed, which is win-win in my book.
Folks, one thing I do want to mention is I did upgrade to battery-powered uh, power equipment. So I now have this little, um, this little handheld blower, uh, which I really enjoy. For jobs like this, I'd rather bring this little blower. Or if you're like mulching and you just need to blow off the, um, the driveway or the rocks or some plants, um, you know, you don't have to have smelly gas. You don't have to pull it to start it. You just press a button and go. So I, I really do like this little electric blower. You're not going to use a blower like this for your leaf cleanup every fall. You still need gas for that. But these little blowers are awesome. Uh, and I also got a uh, battery-powered weed whacker. And since I bought that, I've actually given away my gas one because the battery-powered weed whacker is literally um, half the weight of, of the gas one, half the noise of the gas one, there's no gas fumes generated when you use it, and the gas isn't dripping on you when you use it. So, um, weed whacker, maybe not if you're doing lawns all day every day, but if you're a, a residential or you use the weed whacker for garden maintenance, um, get a good, get a good. I, I like Husqvarna. Uh, to me, it's professional quality, and it's built just like the... Um, the stuff I'm used to with gas, it, it, it's built in the same way, the, the controls are the same, the feel is the same, just a lot lighter. Um, so I'm a big fan of Husqvarna. This is our end result, and, and I will have to go back and do a little more pruning. And if you look at the base of the shrub, you can see it looks like there's a bunch of mulch. You know, over the years, the mulch has come up. So I'll very gently try to rake some of that mulch away. But another thing I do when I'm pruning is I try to leave like a six inch gap between the ground and the foliage so whoever's doing the leaf cleanup can blow the leaves out of there. I will go back and, and invariably tweak this uh, holly a little bit more. I'll, I'll prune out some of the dead stuff. But you know, if you step back, it really, it looks better. I don't know if I'd say it looks good, but it looks better than it does this close. But um, I think we really nailed, these two Olga are exactly the way I would prune them. Um, again, ideally you would do this pruning for the Olga, like right after they bloomed, you would give them a heavy pruning like this. And the holly, holly blooms in the spring. So I, you know, if you're doing a heavy pruning like this, you're gonna lose a lot of your flowers or foliage anyways. But just from re regenerating, I would prune the holly first thing in the spring. And if it was as, as overgrown as this, the Olga first thing in the spring too. And just assume you're not gonna have many flowers next year. We did, the Olga, we did manage to save some flowers. So this will flower next year. All right, folks, so that's gonna do it for today. It's gonna be a short one. You know, let me know if you wanna see me do a little bit every day. I don't know if I can be this detailed every day, but a lot of people ask about how to prune. But I'm going to be here for a while. Um, I'll be honest, jobs like this kind of drain me quicker because, uh, you know, usually it takes a lot longer than I thought it would. Progress takes, you know, longer. Uh, quite often my customer will come back and be like, oh, it looks like that, you know? <laughs> um, as far as doing this type of work, you know, to make money, I. I can't really say I ever make money on this because to make money doing this type of work, you probably have to charge, you know, take whatever you think your hours are going to be to do a job like this and just multiply by three. And then, uh, you know, just wait for your customer to laugh at you. So uh, this actually is for, for, um, for somebody, uh, a relative, um, but it makes great content. So I thought you guys might enjoy watching me do this, but, uh, you know, you could make better money mowing lawns than doing this. Um, because it's just a ton of work. I mean, it's, it's very satisfying. Uh, maybe I should make that the title something about satisfying shrub pruning. But, um, you know, if you are a, a new homeowner and you, your home is overgrown and you have more time than you have money, this is gonna save you a ton of money you can prune back overgrown rhododendrons, overgrown holly, you know, the broadleaf rhododendrons, same idea. So you can definitely do this and, and just, you know, just, just, just a little at a time, right? 
Um, don't prune in the middle of summer when things are dry. Try not to prune the end of the summer so the growth gets encouraged right before I'm losing my son. Try not to prune the end of the summer because you don't want to encourage growth right before things freeze over, but within two or three weeks, we're going to have the first frost. Growth is going to stop and this thing will just uh, grow out in the spring. So um, I think that's going to be it for today, folks. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.